and welcome to MEC 2019. It's such a privilege to be here, and I want to thank the organizers. I think I told you that I was not scheduled to be here at this particular MEC because you didn't set your date on time, and I had booked another assignment in another part of the world. But the Lord worked a miracle. Unfortunately, I lost my brother, which forced me to be in West Africa. We were at the funeral last week, and so I decided to be at MEC. I want to thank you for all that you are doing for Nigeria and for Africa and for setting the tone. I wasn't supposed to speak because of the schedule, but you managed to carve out a time for me, and you've asked me to share some pep talk, anything on my heart. So I'll take the liberty to do so. Let me begin by saying the theme you have chosen is an incredibly powerful theme. All or nothing. And I would say now is the time. Either you give your all or you give nothing at all. The message I'll be sharing with you is entitled Top of the Top Ten. Top of the Top Ten. If you want an alternate title, it is different. Different. But allow me to comment on your theme, All or Nothing. I find it fascinating and perhaps providential that you have chosen the theme, All or Nothing. You need to know that last year, the entire Ghana National Association of Adventist Students. That was their theme, all or nothing. I happened to speak at the two major unions, the Northern Ghana Union way in the north on the theme all or nothing. And then in the Southern Ghana Union, we had an all city zonal fellowship of students, public university students, all or nothing. I'm pleased to notice that one of your speakers uh, Brother Ghana is also here to speak to you on the need to reach the upper classes of society. I spoke at the University of Ghana at the Mensasaba Hall where we have this all or nothing. This is the university campus uh, where we had that particular uh, series of presentations. I like that hall because my best man at my wedding happens to be the dean for that hall. That is him. He's a professor in zoology. And the logo for that hall says knowledge, honor, and service. And so the students chose that particular hall for the event. I was thrilled as I walked, climbed the stairs to that particular hall to see all of the students wearing their t-shirts. All or nothing. Designed by our own brother, Josiah, whom you just uh, saw. He does most of our graphic designs, all or nothing. What was fascinating about this is every T-shirt had a different writing at the back. That explains the meaning of all or nothing. One of them was, God wants you at his best, not at yours. When we say God wants the very best, it is not your best. He wants you to be at his best for your life. All or nothing. I like one. Another quote at the back of one of the t-shirts says, only the fully surrendered can be changed. Fully surrendered. All or nothing. Another says, Jesus gave all of himself for all of you. All or nothing. And so as I wanted the, 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 the hall to see every student, all or nothing, different colors, and they were very creative in conceptualizing this concept of all or nothing. One says, imperfect faithfulness is perfect unfaithfulness. All or nothing. I would say commitment not involvement, all or nothing. Public service, not self-service, all or nothing. Excellence, not mediocrity, because excellence is distinction, mediocrity is extinction, and you can choose to be distinct or extinct, all or nothing. I wish I had time 
to share with you the history of Alive Nigeria because my, my burden is we are lowering down the standard and we haven't caught a glimpse of what Alive Nigeria is all about. Alive Nigeria is part of a network of a grassroots young professional graduate movement. All these were started at campus at the University of Michigan, which happens to be also the birthplace of GYC. Our goal is to establish a Bible-based revival movement in which every student is a missionary. And we seek to transform ministry to students into a movement of students. We are not content with, this is a ministry to students. It's almost like you are babysitting people, ministry to them. No, we want it to be a movement of students. Say amen. amen. And so in 1998, campus was started. And as part of the network of grassroots movements that campus gave birth to, Alive was one of them. Alive stands for Africans Living in View of Eternity. It was started by students, graduate students in North America, from Africa. You see their faces over there. Young people came from some of the most prestigious universities from different parts of the world, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Malawi, Ghana, South Africa, Rwanda, Zambia, all of them. These are the faces of the people who started alive. And then they teamed out with their fellow Africans. Every summer they will come to Africa, go to the most remote area, and there they would impact it. The screen you see on your is one group going to Zambia. Arriving at the airport, they will take a bus, drive five hours to the north, then cross the, uh, uh, the, the lake and for two hours, then walk two miles to the most remote area, sleep on the floor, and do missions. That was the spirit of a life. Amen? Amen? One of our students, a former missionary, graduated from Harvard. She didn't even have time to rest. That very day after her graduation, we said, Tando, go to Ghana and start a life Ghana. And so she came. She was the editor of our campus press. She came, mobilized a group of Ghanaian students, graduates. We went way to the north, the Muslim territory, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And she sent a message back, Dr. Pepem, we have a world to change. And by the grace of God, let's keep moving. From there, they went to Liberia shortly after the war. Others went to Eritrea. Some wanted to go to Somalia during the war, and I said no. And within that setting, Alive Nigeria was also born. To mobilize a grassroots movement of young professionals who would give their all or nothing. It is an NGO. It is not a typical self-supporting ministry. No, this is an NGO of graduates and young professionals with a vision for missionary service. Sometimes you lose your identity, you think you're another regular guy. No, 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 no. This is a movement. And you've got to run your programs as professionals. That is why this is called a conference, not a camp meeting, not a retreat, not one of those things. You ought to execute your programs as graduates and young professionals. Say amen. amen. And backing you and behind the scenes are people who had gone ahead of us. On your screen, you see a picture of a missionary couple from America who came to Nigeria years ago, went to Ile Ife, and then from there they went to Nyegre in the north. Here is their picture. The little girl in their midst with two boys, the little girl is one of the sponsors of Alive Nigeria and Alive Ghana and many of the Alive movements. When I was coming to Nigeria, I said, Dr. Jensla, she's uh, an eye doctor also, Give me some of your old uh, pictures of your presence in Nigeria. And there she is. This is the father. The father was a physician. The mother was a nurse. Together with some of the missionaries who came to Nigeria. And here they have organized the Docker's women. They did a phenomenal work. Way up in the north. This is the two kids. 
The two young boys now, they are now all physicians. The young girl who is the sponsor of her life is the one in the middle with her adopted black doll. <laughs> she was here in Nigeria for seven years. God birthed in her heart a missionary spirit. And so when after they left Nigeria, the parents went to Southeast Asia, worked in Thailand, Work in Sarawak and many other places. In fact, this girl whom you see on the screen, when they went to Asia, she was so impacted by what she had experienced in Africa and Asia that when she went back to the States, graduated with a degree in medicine, she decided to go back as a missionary to Cambodia. And that is her. Cambodia at the time of war. Her mother who died last year, you see her on the screen. The father, who is 98 years, who was here as a missionary, he is not doing too well. I promise to share their picture, to inspire you, alive Nigeria. This woman is slaving herself in her hospital work to raise money to support mission work. The work in Asia, the work in Africa is all supported by her. This is the spirit that gave birth to a life or Nigeria. All or nothing. That ought to be the spirit. And I pray that by the grace of God, you'll catch the spirit of the young people who started a life in North America. Some of your sponsors, including Dr. Jensler, who and their parents came to Nigeria as missionaries. We were planning to come here back to Nigeria. Team up with Alive Nigeria to do some mission work. And we will be doing so in the future. Amen? Amen? The message I'm coming to share with you is a random message. I was thinking, what should I share with all of you? We have a seminar with Pastor God's Will titled, you know, God's, how do you title it? Godly Men of Excellence. Godly Men Par Excellence. And the presentation I gave in one of that sessions, I thought I should share it with all of you. So for this presentation, I title it Top of the Top Ten. If you want a different title, Be Different. By the time we are done, I'm going to challenge you. Godly men of excellence, alive members, dare to stand up. They stand out and they stand tall. They are different. When I say different, another long title will be Be Different. Or dare to be different. Because the world is full of ordinary people and we cannot afford more ordinary people. We want people who are different. Steve Jobs is one who revolutionized this concept of being different. When he was introducing one of his Apple Mac products, he lifted up one of the products and made a toast. Some of you may need to go and check that commercial. A brilliant commercial. He was toasting to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an Apple product. And I'm toasting to the greatest men who lived in the world who think different. The slogan of his commercial is think different. Not think differently. Think different. And as you watch the screen, they brought Muhammad Ali. They brought, you know, uh, all the key people, Martin Luther King Jr. As they were passing by, Steve Jobs made this narration. Here is to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They are not fond of rules. They have no respect for the status quo. You can cut them. You can disagree with them. You can glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you cannot do is to ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. My message has been summarized by this. Dare to be different. Refuse to go along in order to get along. Live different. Be different. Be countercultural. That was what Steve Jobs stood for. And from his example, I'll call your attention. Steve Jobs came and changed a whole generation by the products. 
He said our goal is to make the best devices in the world, not to be the biggest. And the devices we invent must be simple enough, but versatile enough. He took the letter I, an ordinary character, which even little kids can write. You just write a little stick, put a dot, letter I, and he revolutionized the concept of I. From iPod, iPad, iPhone, iCloud, and everything I. One person changed our concept of I. We are here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why else be here? This is a secular man speaking, and I'm going to use his words to challenge us from scripture. If you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader, sell ice cream. He tells us, my job is not to be easy on people, my job is to make them better. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Being the richest man, Steve Jobs says, in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night, saying we've done something wonderful, that is what matters to me. I was worth over a million dollars when I was 23. I was worth $10 million when I was 24, over 100 million when I was 25, and it wasn't that important because I never did it for money. What did he do it for? He did it to make a difference. And so his message to all of us, if today were your last day in life, would you want to do what you're about to do today? It's a question Christians must answer. The people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Sometimes he tells us dealing with failure, life hits you in the head with a brick, don't lose faith. Speaking at the graduation towards the end of his life when he was battling with cancer, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever accounted to help me make the big choices in life. And he made many statements. He said, learn how to anticipate the future. Focus on the positive. Fail forward. Travel the world. Find the right partner. Obstacles are opportunities in disguise. Take risks. Surround yourself with great people. Remember you will be dead soon and learn from others. Finally, he concludes, all I ask is that today you do the best work of your entire life. From Steve Jobs, I get an alternate title, different. Dare to be different. Because the world is already full of ordinary people. Alive Nigeria, dare to be different. Before I open the word, let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, in the next few minutes, challenge us with a message of hope and encouragement so that we'll be different. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message, Top of the Top Ten. Be top of the top ten. I'm coming to speak to you about Enoch, the best amongst the best. If you read Genesis chapters 4 and 5, you are going to come across a genealogy, two genealogies. One is the genealogy of Cain. The other is the genealogy of Seth. Adam and Eve, they got their firstborn. What was his name? Cain. Cain, then they got their secondborn. What was his name? Abel. And then what did Cain do to Abel? He killed Abel. That's why you don't see Abel's line. Then they got another child. They named him Seth. And the Bible tells us Cain had a line, an evil line, and yet they were great accomplishes. Seth had a line. We are coming to look at the line of Seth. The line of Cain, if you read Genesis chapter 4 from verses 16 to 24, it tells us they were great accomplishes. He lists their names. And then he goes on to tell us what they did. Verse 20, Adder bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents. He had livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman, bronze iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And then he goes on to list a host of things. From the line of Cain, we discover that they are credited with worldly progress. Cain built the first city. From his descendants came technological and cultural contributions. Metal workers, ranchers, agriculturists, musicians were all in that line. But Seth's line, though they had great men, their greatest investment, their greatest gift was they raised up a generation to follow the Lord's program. Amen? 
Cain built for his son, but Seth built into his son. Cain sacrificed his sons for success. Seth found success in his sons. And within the line of Seth, the ten generations from Adam, tens with Noah, Enoch emerged as the best of the best. What I'm coming to challenge you is, don't just compare yourself with Cain and say, I am a better person than Cain. What I am challenging you is, amongst the best line, be the very best. Amen? Enoch was the brightest. If you read Genesis chapter 5, 1 to 3, it's a whole genealogy. Verses 1 and 2 tells us it begins with the time God created Adam and Eve. Verse 3 says, Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness after his own image. He named him Seth. Now, follow the genealogy. You are going to notice a pattern. And it is intentionally made. I hope you can pick up the pattern. Verse 4. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years. He had sons and daughters. So all the days of Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Seth lived 105 years. He begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years. He had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years. He begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years, had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Are you noticing a pattern? Somebody lived begot someone and the bible says after living and begotten that one he afterward he had sons and daughters and then he gives us the whole period of his existence and then they died the firstborn son is the one who is listed first they begot Canaan lived 70 years, he begot Mahalalil. After he begot Mahalalil, Canaan lived 840 years, he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, he died. Mahalalil lived 65 years, begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalil lived 830 years, he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalil were 895 years, he died. Jared lived 162 years, he begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 and whatever years. And after that, he had sons and daughters, and he died. Have you noticed what is happening? All of them lived, begot, had sons and daughters, died. Then comes a different one. Verse 9. Verse, what, let me start with verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years. He begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. I hope you caught the difference. All the others, they begot. Lived, had sons and daughters, died. When it comes to Enoch, it is different. Enoch lived, begot his firstborn. He walked with God. Then after walking with God, he had sons and daughters. All his days of life were given us. Then he walked with God and he did not die. He was taken to heaven. And then you follow on and on. Enoch was different. All the others lived and died. Enoch didn't just live. What did he do? He walked with God and instead of dying, what happened? He was taken to heaven. He lived differently and he ended differently. That's the summary of the message. Here are the Bible texts that refer to Enoch. I will extract a principle from it and you see the implication for all or nothing. Hebrews 11 verse 5 and 6 refers to Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. He's quoting from Genesis. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased the Lord. So walking with the Lord means pleasing the Lord. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, which means he was a man of faith. For he who comes to God must first believe he is, so he trusted the Lord. He is a reward of those who seek him diligently. 
Another reference to Jude. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these, thing, these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly amongst them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. So Enoch was a preacher. It didn't end there. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Enoch suffered persecution. But he refused to give up. He walked with the Lord. He exercised faith in the Lord. He pleased the Lord. He preached a righteous life. And consequently, when all the others died, God took him. Amen? Amen. Here's the summary of the kind of person we ought to be when we say all or nothing. Enoch lived differently, he ended differently. By faith, he walked with God. What this means is he was at the same place that God was at the same time. They were moving in the same direction. They were walking at the same pace. Amen? Enoch was a man of faith. The Bible says he pleased the Lord. And without faith, it is impossible to please. If you want to serve the Lord, alive Nigeria, alive Africa, we've got to be men and women of faith who please the Lord or do what is pleasing to the Lord. Amen? Enoch was countercultural. He refused to go along in order to get along. All the world was moving in one direction. Enoch said, no, I refuse to go along in order to get along. Countercultural. He was consistent. He was a Christian. He walked with the Lord. Had his child. After that, he had children again. He was countercultural. Enoch passed on the baton. If there is time, I will develop it better. He passed on to the next generation. He trained leaders. Good leaders not only train their successors, but they train their successors to supersede them. He was taken to heaven. And because he preached about the second coming of Christ, Enoch was an Adventist. He looked forward to the second advent of Christ. Our generation is looking for men and women in Africa who are countercultural. They will move against the tide of corruption, ineptitude, incompetence, and give the Lord their very best. Africa is dying for the men and women of Alive. You were raised up in this country for a purpose. Alive Nigeria sets the pace for the whole world. Your country, Nigeria, set the pace for the entire continent. You have enough resources. You have human capital, human resources. Brain power are all in this country. And yet your country is dysfunctional. It is dysfunctional because Adventists are dysfunctional. We are the light of the world. We are the generation that should make a difference. And Alive Nigeria, there will be a curse on this land if you refuse to rise up and make a difference. The days are over when you just come to live meetings and go through the motions. We have had enough of mech meetings. Now is the time to rise up. Let me challenge you with this closing thought. We need radical Christians. I wrote a little booklet titled Stand Up and Be Counted, and this is how I concluded the introduction. People who change the world are radicals. They refuse to go along in order to get along. They would rather die than be slaves of public opinion. The status quo labels them as controversial. That's what they did to Enoch. They challenge and tell people they are extremists. They are troublemakers. They are not wanted. And because they turn the world upside down, their names and views are often greeted with fear and dread. The time has come for our Christian commitment to be radical. The word radical comes from the Latin root, which means go to the origin, go to the root, go to the essence of something. It's time to be Christian radicals. If the Bible is true, if our message is the truth, if the signs of the times mean anything to us, if revival and reformation are possible in our day, then we must be radical for the Lord. The time has come for us to be ashamed of our superficial religious experiences, our mediocre performance, our waffling positions, and the cheap vanilla faith that costs us nothing. Unless we are radically committed to the Lord and his word, our profession is empty sloganeering. Radical commitment is a call to Christian nonconformity. 
It is a plea to stand out and be countercultural. It is a challenge to be real, to practice what we profess. Anything less is unbiblical, it is irrational, and is irrelevant, if not a betrayal. Now is the time to stand, to stand out, to stand up, to stand tall. We need an Enoch generation, the best amongst the best. Enoch did not compare himself with the godly, worldly progress line of Cain. Within the good line of Seth, he was the best. He was the higher than the highest, the top of the top ten. That is the generation Africa needs. That is the generation the world needs. And that is why you are alive, Nigeria. May the Lord help each one of us, by the grace of God, to be amongst the Enoch generation. Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? I would invite you to stand and let your prayer be, Lord, help me to be different, to think different, to live different, and to live my life in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have done by assembling us at this particular time in our history. You have brought some of the finest around the world to instruct us in your ways. We have listened to many lectures, but the time has come for us to live out the things we are learning. And that from the experience we are going to have, by your grace we shall go forth and be different, countercultural in our communities, in our classrooms, in our places of work, in our churches. By your grace, help us to be the top of the top tens wherever we find ourselves. Let this generation, which is holding the baton that has been bequeathed to them from a generation before them, and the sacrifices of others, help us that we don't betray the trust. May we remain faithful, giving you our all or nothing at all. To obey you fully. Because obedience delayed is disobedience. Obedience deferred is disobedience. Help us to be committed, not just involved. And keep us faithful to the very end. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.